Okay. Welcome to all of all of you. Um, we would like to tell you something about fearless automation and what we accomplish with uh, Yaouk in OpenStack. Um, Let's quickly introduce, uh, we have uh, Felix here from uh, Schwarz IT, he is a cloud engineer. We have uh, Jonas here, which is a <laughs> team lead of cloud development at Cloud and & Heat, and I'm Marvin, I'm a product owner at Stackit. Um, we would like to talk about uh, what is Stackit, what is the Schwarz Group, then uh, show you some use cases uh, for what we are using OpenStack and uh, the growth of uh, our cloud platform, and then we talk about Yaouk. Um, to talk about the Schwarz Group first, it's one of the um, uh, companies which has multiple sub-companies in it, mostly famous for the retailer brands Lidl and Kaufland. Um, we also have a recycling company called PreZero, and we also have a, uh, multiple production facilities with uh, Bon Gelati, which are doing ice cream, or we have like the MEG who is... Uh, uh, ref refilling water bottles, like f for Lidl, for example. And within this group, uh, Felix and I are part of the Schwarz IT, which is like the, let's say, the, the heart of all of this, where all the IT solutions are made, developed, uh, and operated. And within this Schwarz IT, uh, we created uh, Stackit, which is a sub-brand in the Schwarz IT, and uh, there we created the uh, Stackit Cloud, uh, which we offer for, for the DACH market uh, in uh, Europe. And uh, our target customers are mostly like the small, medium enterprises uh, in the DACH market. And for doing such a challenge, we think about uh, it's easier with a companion. And there comes Cloud and Heat uh, in place, which helped us to develop Yaouk. And Jonas will tell something about Cloud yeah. and Heat. Just a few words. Um, Cloud and Heat is a small company which has started about 10 years ago with uh, the mission to provide a sustainable and uh, yeah, holistic cloud stack built up on innovative water cooling and uh, converged infrastructure using OpenStack as the software stack, which is why we're here after all. And we have recently also expanded in the, into the managed Kubernetes. Um, yeah, market, uh, we have a partnership or rather a joint venture with the SQLNEC, which is the SQL stack, which is a hardened version of OpenStack. Uh, there are also some people from that here. And um, yeah, we're supporting the Schwarz in running their OpenStack cluster and developing Yauk. Okay, then I would continue a little bit uh, and talk about our use cases. Uh, so on the one hand, we're using the OpenStack environment that we have inside the Schwarz Group a lot, and on the other end, a little bit for external customers. The nature of providing a cloud service is that we definitely don't know all of our customers at all, because from an infrastructure perspective, they are all just VMs. But we have uh, two big users that I want to highlight a little bit. We have a use case named App Cloud based on Cloud Foundry, where a lot of internal and external Internal apps are running. Cloud Foundry is basically allowing you to ship applications using some predefined build packs, so you don't need to care about Docker files, deployments, or things like that. Uh, you just push your code, and the uh, system handles the rest. This whole environment is quite or consists of two environments. Uh, in total, around 3,000 virtual machines, six and a half thousand vCPUs, and 20 terabytes of memory basically amounting to 25 to 35% of our whole environment, depending on if you count instances or vCPUs. If we take a look at the other use case, it's the Stackit Kubernetes engine. Uh, there we don't provide one big Kubernetes cluster, but we provide our users with individual Kubernetes clusters for each use case. So you can go there and say, I need a Kubernetes cluster now, say what kind of workers you want, and uh, get that here. In total there, we are running 250 clusters with uh, 2,500 instances, 10,000 vCPUs, and 25 terabytes of memory. Uh, and with that, they are definitely our largest shareholder if you count based on vCPUs. Over the last year, we had a lot of growth there. We grew from 13,000 vCPUs to 24,000, mostly based on the Schwarz Kubernetes engine. Um, and also increased our memory 
uh, footprint that we gave to our users by 60%. And yes, you can see that our OpenStack Prometheus exporter died in the middle of the graph. <laughs> 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 and now the question is, how do we run all this? Uh, we do that using Yaouk, and I'll hand over to Jonas for that. Yeah, um, for this part, um, we want to start with a little bit of motivation because uh, when you, in these days, come up with a new OpenStack lifecycle management, you need to have a really good reason for that. And uh, we hope we have that. Um, so we, we made three core decisions here. Um, the first one was we want to run OpenStack on Kubernetes, so have Kubernetes as a layer below. Firstly, because declarative things are really nice. Um, they allow you to define how your infrastructure is, and then there's a thing which ensures that the infrastructure actually is how you want it to be. And in addition to that, Kubernetes gives you some real good goodies to, which are useful in the OpenStack world. For instance, uh, having replicas of your APIs and being able to scale this up easily, that usually doesn't come with a, let's say, classical lifecycle management like Ansible or so. It's not easy to say, yeah, I want like 10 replicas of the Keystone API running on this node, or I want five. I don't know. That's generally not that easy. They are not that flexible. So Kubernetes is much more flexible in this regard, and you get the replicas, you get networking, and you also get liveness probes, which is, of course, really important to run a reliable service, to have things which are not working recycled, taken out of the rotation, taken out of the load balancer, so that API requests are not failing all the time or not failing because of a temporary outage or whatever. As a bonus, when you run stuff on Kubernetes, it's easier to port it to other platforms and you get easier testing because all you need is a Kubernetes cluster, and you can get that, for instance, from a Gardener instance or from a cluster API provider. You just can set it up, and then you have that cluster for testing Yaouk, which improves development drastically. In our classical lifecycle management, that was a major problem that you always had to get like physical hardware and have the installation procedure, which is really daunting. And finally, you also get observability from Kubernetes because you have all the status and it's continuously checking the status of services. So we can monitor that more easily without having to write specific checks for each service. So that is how Yaouk was born. It is yet another OpenStack lifecycle management on top of Kubernetes. You might get the drift where the name comes from by now. Um, it is a complete tool with the holistic background Cloud and Heat has, so in installing and upgrading from the bare metal on using Open, OpenStack Ironic as the bare metal layer, so to speak, then installing on top of that Kubernetes using Ansible, and then on top of that OpenStack. How do we install OpenStack? It's not with OpenStack Helm. Um, this is the second decision, and drawing back to the title, fearless automation. Automation being the keyword here. We took the idea from Kubernetes to have control loops which continuously check the state of the system because in an unintended system, the breakage can only increase. So we have these operators, which are for each OpenStack service one or more, which take the declared state of the service, like I want a keystone here with three API replicas, a database which is backed up regularly, and so on and so forth. And they check the state of the cluster against that. So is the deployment, using, we are using, of course, Kubernetes deployments, is the deployment set to three replicas, do we have the database, is the database healthy, are the users created in the database, and so forth, and have, checking this regularly and also based on watches to orchestrate the entire Kubernetes rollout and also to handle Kubernetes lifecycling like upgrades in this fashion. Um, taking Glance as an example, if you know Kubernetes, you know what this is. This is um, a custom resource where, you, where we define the Glance deployment, so to speak. And uh, because we have operators, we have for each yeah, OpenStack service component a separate resource type, which is re referred to by the kind, and then you put in all the specification of the, uh, which makes up a Glance, like how many replicas does my da database have, how many replicas does my API have, the backend configuration, the policies you want to inject, your target release, ob obviously, which is yoga, what else would it be? And um, <laughs> definitely no Queen's clusters in production. I assure you, or no Pike either, or Rocky, or Train. No, none of those. It's all yoga. And, um, <laughs> and you can, of course, also inject arbitrary config. To some extent, I will get to that in the decision three. Um, and also self-configuration. And that is then fed into the operator, which reads that and gets notified on updates. So when you edit this, it gets a watch from a, a not an event from the Kubernetes API, and then it ensures that your specification is actually put in place in the cluster. 
doing all of this, it goes through this fun graph, which I won't go into detail, just, it's, it's just an illustration. Um, so for instance, we have the config generation step below here, which feeds, which has some input. So this is really a, a state machine, so to speak, or a, a, a dependency network rather. So we have, for instance, the config thing down here, which of course depends on the keystone information. It needs to know where keystone is to get keystone user credentials. It needs to have, to have its database to gener generate the database URLs, which Glance needs the user password and so on. Which is, which is then fed into a database sync job and to the, into the meter dev loading of Glance, which is also a separate job. And only when that is done, it will install or update the API deployment. And then it will create the Kubernetes service. And then from that, we have the service monitors, which are the monitoring and so, on, and so forth. And the point of this is that this dependency network is a directed acyclic graph, which is nice, because that means we can go through it in a defined order and have it Recon have this be our core of the reconcile loop. And we don't have to write all of this by hand, that would be crazy, but instead we have a declarative approach within Yahoo itself in the code, which allows us to write this in a more sensible manner. And the loop then on every iteration checks where the things are which have divergences. For instance, when I change the configuration, then this will mark as unready, and the configuration will be applied, and then in the next iteration, it will note, okay, the configuration has changed, I need to run deep DB sync, and then until it eventually reaches the API deployment. That also means if the configuration is invalid, it will never reach the API deployment. Um, for instance, or rather, what means, what does invalid mean? Decision three. Of course, we introduced Kubernetes in the stack, we introduced operators, that's a lot of moving parts, so we have to eliminate complexity somewhere else, otherwise this gets completely unmanageable. And configuration management is hard. And for Glance it may be rather easy because you generally only have like this Glance config and then you're happy. But for something like Neutron or Nova, where you ha might have node-specific configuration, where you might have to inject, for instance, on your gateway nodes, you need to inject more VLANs which are provisioned by L2 to make them accessible, your provider networks, they all need to be configured, but they may be node specific. So the question is, how do you merge all of this together without being completely lost when you need to track down where is this incorrect configuration coming from? And for that, we use QLang, which is a framework for yeah, working with data, and we use it for working with configuration. And QLang doesn't allow you to have two conflicting values. It's that easy. So if you have two inputs to the same configuration and they say different things, then it will just error. And then the operator will halt and tell you, well, that's not valid. You need to fix that. And I won't hand it down to any service before you do. Um, that's just one example of complexity elimination. But it's a really nice one, because I think this is one of the banes of other configuration management tools and other lifecycle management tools that you have multiple inputs to the same thing. And if they differ, well, one of them wins but it's not clear where that came from. It might be clear when you know all of the inputs, which will win, but if you look at the output, it's hard to track down. So if you have an incorrect configuration, that it's hard to track down. This isn't the case here because only one can be valid, and otherwise it will tell you there's a conflict. Yeah, that was our road to Yauk. Um, there's obviously a lot more to it. Um, in the end, uh, a slot is only that long, although I think we do have some time left. So if you have any spontaneous ideas you want to talk about, Otherwise, we will have you have us guided by questions. That works. Um, so maybe just a quick rundown from then. Um, at 20, 2018, the stack it was started with the OpenStack Endeavor, then using a different platform I might probably not name. Um, 2020, uh, support by Cloud and Heat was brought in, and we have started supporting them with operating the platform. And in mid of 2020, we had the initial idea of how that we should do Yaug and the concept. And uh, nearly a year after it was open sourced, and in September 2021, I think you pulled Glance into production, and that worked nicely. And then yep. even more stuff is pulled into production. I heard 100 compute nodes deployed in parallel the other day, which was nice. And yeah. Depends so. who you are asking if it was nice, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> it mostly worked. There were some hitches along the road, but I uh, mean, yeah, yeah. that's what you get when you run a th thing first time. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have a website for Yauk. Um, it's all open source on gitlab.com, and um, that's the main deal, and we are now open for questions, I think. Yeah.
for the questions, there would be a microphone. Otherwise, I will call you out, and uh, then you can just raise your question. I will, or any of us will repeat it, and then, so that's on the stream too. Yes, you were first, I think. Yeah, it's okay. It does, you're right about that. So the question was, um, how does the bare metal part of Yahook work essentially? So especially day two and storage. Um, so I will maybe go about day first a little bit to get some, give some context and then we will talk about day two. Um, so I already hinted at we are using OpenStack Ironic, obviously. Um, we have a small component called the metal controller which essentially ties together NetBox, OpenStack Ironic and HashiCorp Vault. As you got bought for the IPMI credentials and some onboarding of the nodes, uh, Netbox to know which IP addresses they should get, and OpenStack Ironic for the obvious part, actually getting the thing to do what it's supposed to do. Um, that then it gets a config drive, which essentially comp contains, um, I think, now I see full Ansible? Yeah, the full Ansible repository which deploys Kubernetes, uh, as well as some config additional configuration like not the join token that's fetched from Vault, but you get the drift. And that is then run on the first, run, on the first boot using cloud init and the run script, and then it is joined into the Kubernetes cluster. And from there on, it is mostly Kubernetes things. Um, node upgrades is currently not fully defined within the Oak project. I'm not sure what you are doing. We are doing it with, uh, yeah, kind of running Ansible yeah. on top we of the nodes. Okay, you do the same, same thing. Um, so the, the Ansible playbooks exist for Kubernetes, and they can also be used to upgrade the nodes and also upgrade the Kubernetes clusters. There's not much automation in that regard. That's something which is being worked on. Also, to integrate and to communicate with uh, the operators to let them know beforehand so that they can evacuate the workload when you're starting to um, yeah, upgrade a node. So this is also maybe one key thing about Yahoo that the operators are communicating about things like this. So if you change the layer two configuration, for instance, it will generally proactively try to evacuate the node first if compute workload is running on it because it might be disruptive and it tries to avoid that. Um, regarding storage, right, that was the second part of the question. Um, Rook, obviously. Um, we are not tied to Ceph, though. They are running this with NetApp, yep. which is obviously completely different. But um, the Ansible playbooks for the Kubernetes cluster also cover um, installing Rook if you want it optionally. Otherwise, you have to integrate it differently. You can run it next to it, doesn't matter, just as long as it's reachable. And what basically what you saw as a configuration for Ceph is basically in the Rook format. So if you use Rook, you can yep. directly link to it and the format just matters. Yep. So it expects kind of the Rook format, but you can use different stuff to generate the same thing. Yes, you were next, I think. No, behind you, sorry. Um, sorry, I didn't catch that. Can you try louder? How do you manage possible conflict between the OpenStack network and the trained network pointer on IP table? Ah, uh, yeah, that's, that's easy. <laughs> that's, uh, or it was a fun story to begin with. Uh, the question was basically how we handle the conflict bet potentially between uh, Kubernetes networking and OpenStack networking. Uh, we, in our environment, were using IP tables firewalls rules previously and tried it out, and that didn't end that well. Um, the solution there is basically to switch to the open vSwitch firewall driver and then basically avoid this whole kind of issue. Yeah. Just don't use IP tables <laughs> in OpenStack. <laughs> that helps. Um, do you also generate uh, all of the things that Metro deploys on the app or configure OpenStack? So would a new release, a new config flag, anything you want to create for mm. the custom resource definition? So is that like the the question was about the format of the CRDs and how they are getting there. The CRDs are basically handcrafted at that point in time. The configuration validation then afterwards is going against the config defini defined by Oslo config. Maybe to be more specific, um, the TLDs are not completely handwritten. That would, again, be a daunting task. But um, they are also generated via Qlang. It can also output JSON. So we are effectively gen putting snippets together of the CLDs. So like we have the API section there. We use it for all services, obviously. So that's not 
always copy pasted, but it's composed together. So, but yeah. So and yeah, the other part is Oslo, which isn't in the CIDs. There, there the CIDs are actually free form, and the generations, uh, the validation against Oslo is only happening in the operator. So you can actually apply an inc invalid configuration, for instance, a list instead of a string, but the operator will then reject it and tell you that doesn't work. You need to change it. Yeah. The question was whether a CNI is used or whether we are using host networking exclusively. Um, a CNI is used, that works splendidly actually. Um, our default is Calico, but we are not sold on that. I think you can use any CNI which provides the basic stuff. Yeah, but there's also the side effect that potentially VXLAN ports might overlap between yeah. the CNI and what Neutron does. Then IP tables rules to do a migration might rescue you, but they are horrible. Do we have any further questions? Yes? The question was whether the uh, Yahoo OpenStack layer, so to speak, can be used standalone without all the stuff below that. And the answer is clearly yes. So for instance, we run our CI on a Gardener cluster. Others use, well, okay, that's again Yo Kubernetes, so yeah, that doesn't count, but it isn't tied to the Kubernetes layer, so it just needs basic Kubernetes functionality. We have a list of requirements in the documentation, actually, but it isn't that steep, so you need an ingress cert manager, and uh, I think that's... A storage class. And you need a storage class, but other than that, any Kubernetes cluster will do. So I actually run it on K3S on my laptop. It works as well, although it drains the battery quite fast. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, anything else? Okay, if there's anything, no, nothing else, then I would say thank you. You can meet us here or in the uh, Yahoo channel on the OFTC ISC, right? That's OFTC, yeah? And um, thank you for your attention, I guess. Thank you. And also, if you would like, we have stickers here. Yeah?